we go. Okay, so okay. today, uh, Dr. Busi is one of our cardiology fellows. He'll be revisiting atrial fibrillation. There's a new uh, guideline that's come out for 2020 from the European Society of Cardiology. So it's just the new rethinking on the basics in terms of the clinical approach, uh, when to anticoagulate, uh, how to modify risk factors for atrial fibrillation and, and monitoring of INRs, et cetera. So there's quite a lot that Reese has to unpack for us this morning, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you for taking the time to prepare. And uh, Reese, I'm handing over to you. Take over, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Tabete. Um, thank you everybody for your time. Good morning to you all on this Friday morning. Uh, as Dr. Tabete has said, today we'll be looking at atrial fibrillation, the most common uh, arrhythmia that we face as cardiologists and as general physicians. And we'll be just refreshing our minds with regards to the ASCA guidelines that were released late in 2020. Um, as a result, most of the content from this presentation is based on those guidelines, uh, which was released by the ESC. And we'll be going over basic definitions, diagnosis, screening to some degree, and management in certain particular uh, clinical situations, as well as identifying those individuals which we believe are most at risk for stroke. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's just get straight into it. So the, the definition of atrial fibrillation itself is, is quite basic. Uh, we, we're talking about a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, and primarily it's, a, uh, it's, it's based on an irregularly irregular RR interval with the absence of any distinct P waves or, and the presence of an irregular atrial activation. Clinical atrial fibrillation is something that we commonly use as a term in order to define people who are both symptomatic or asymptomatic in nature. And we make use of ECGs, uh, whether it be a 12 lead ECG or at least a 30 second rhythm strip in order to make this, uh, this diagnosis. Another term that has come out in these recent uh, guidelines is that of an atrial high rate episode. And this basically makes reference to those individuals with no prior atrial fibrillation and has been detected by a cardiac implantable electronic device, something that is referred to here as a CIED. This has been subsequently review, reviewed by a physician, uh, whether it be a clinician, uh, a tech, uh, you know, cardiac tech staff, or, or even a cardiologist, and then has made reference to an individual who may be at risk for atrial fibrillation in and, in and of itself. In terms of the diagnosis itself, it's pretty standard. All you need is a 12 lead ECG, all right? And, and it and makes reference to just a single 12 lead ECG or rather a single lead ECG tracing of at least 30 seconds. And we're talking about here, those individuals without any significant P waves or irregular uh, or basically with irregular RR intervals. So this schematic goes on to describe uh, the, the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation or, or or in this case, uh, atrial high rate episodes. But what I'd just like to draw your attention to here is that it starts off with an individual at risk. In this case, this individual has an implantable device which recognizes these atrial high rate episodes, but we confirm this with an ECG. And this ECG forms a backbone of how we, we diagnose, um, diagnose individuals with atrial fibrillation. So please just re remember, if anyone's of concern, if you're identifying someone who you think may be having atrial fibrillation, just do the ECG. I mean, that, that's going to give you the best amount of information in terms of diagnosing an individual with atrial fibrillation. Now, what about the systems used for, for atrial fibrillation screening? As you know, it's varied. It ranges all the way from clinical examination to blood pressure monitors to more of our futuristic and technological devices. And what I'd just like to talk about here is specifically about wearable technology. Now, everybody these days seems to have a smartphone or smartwatch, but smartwatches in, in and of itself are, are, are becoming increasingly common. And with regards to wearable tech, it's not exactly bulletproof, but it's very, very useful. There's a massive study that was launched through Stanford University in conjunction with Apple called the Apple Heart Study, released in 2019 and published in the NEJM. They looked at about 420,000 people who had an Apple device or an Apple Watch rather, and were receiving irregular heartbeat notifications. And in those individuals, um, the Apple Watch correctly predicted atrial fibrillation in about 85% of patients who had an irregular heartbeat notification. So whilst it's not exactly bulletproof as a mechanism, it's definitely an added tool in our arsenal in terms of recognizing individuals with atrial fibrillation. And we can speak from personal experience for a large amount of individuals with rapid atrial fibrillation who has been diagnosed 
with a smartwatch notification who's come through to our own CCU. Moving on, uh, risk factors. Now, risk factors, as you guys may know, are wide and diverse. If we look at this outer ring, it, these represent our modifiable risk factors, ranging all the way from cardiac to respiratory, both endocrine as well as lifestyle based. They very vary from hypertension, heart failure, vascular heart disease, all the way to dyslipidemia. Alcohol consumption represents quite a significant, uh, significant risk factor. Obesity, don't forget about COPD and sleep apnea. These are also big risk factors with regards to the development of atrial fibrillation. And then our inner ring, which is our non-modifiable uh, risk factors, all the way from aging, certain genetic predispositions, males are tremendously high risk, and ethnicity, especially if you have European descent, places you at higher risk for atrial fibrillation. If you took about a clinical presentation, atrial fibrillation as a whole, if you're going to be presenting a patient with atrial fibrillation, we want to talk about if the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. And those individuals who are symptomatic from the atrial fibrillation, are they unstable or stable? Those kind of features form the backbone. When you're thinking about a patient with atrial fibrillation, that's how you want to be defining them in your mind. With regards to their clinical outcomes, they are far ranging all the way from the severe and significant from death to the ones that are slightly more insidious, depression and impaired quality of life. Stroke is a big one that we all talk about, and that's the one that we, we, we want to be involved in and want to understand really carefully in atrial fibrillation. Cardioembolic stroke in, it, uh, you know, in itself is associated with atrial fibrillations. Generally, it's going to be severe. It's generally highly recurrent. It's often fatal, and it exists often with you know, severe permanent disability. With regards to the mortality, you know, atrial fibrillation has a twofold increase in, in all cause mortality in women, a 1.5 fold increase in men, and overall, about a 3.5 fold increase overall in terms of mortality risk. And in, in terms of heart failure or left ventricular dysfunction, you know, atrial fibrillation and heart failure have a lot of overlap in terms of their common risk factors. They often coexist and they generally you know, precipitate or exacerbate each other, resulting in a combined greater mortality than either condition existing on its own. In terms of the classification of atrial fibrillation, I feel like this is a, often a bit of a stumbling block for most of us here. It's generally based on presentation duration or spontaneous termination of atrial, fibrilla uh, atrial fibrillation episodes. And whilst it, it is traditional, classification often itself does not infer atrial fibrillation both burden nor detect to its management. The most commonly used terms and both probably misunderstood terms here are that of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. Often these terms get bandied about, but not completely understood. For clarity, atrial fibrillation that terminates spontaneously uh, or with an intervention within seven days is what we refer to as paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation that is continuously sustained or includes episodes that are terminated and recur is what we call uh, persistent atrial fibrillation. Whereas permanent atrial fibrillation is a bit more uh, but more probably esoteric, I guess, in a way, because it actually regards a therapeutic attitude that, regards, uh, that exists between both the patient and the physician, in which we go, listen, we are actually not going to consider a rhythm control strategy in terms of trying to restore sinus rhythm. This patient is, is, is basically an individual which we are going to just manage in terms of the atrial fibrillation. We understand they're going to be in permanent atrial fibrillation. Okay. Now, there are a number of terms that we probably should be moving away from. We often talk about them still in some degree, especially with, with regards to valvular versus non-valvular atrial fibrillation. But that term has been generally used in order to direct our anticoagulation strategy. As you know, those individuals with a prosthetic heart valve or those with moderate to severe mitral stenosis should not be on a form of um, NOAC or one of our novel oral anticoagulants. And as a result, that term has, you know, been in favor in terms of directing which way we go with our anticoagulation strategy. But in general, we should be moving away from these terms. Also, chronic atrial fibrillation is very variable. People mean different things when they talk about it. Probably a term that we should be moving away from um, in, in itself, you know. Now, this, um, this, this diagram here is just a schematic, and it represents how we should be structuring our characterization of atrial fibrillation. Whilst it appears to be quite complicated, it's probably something you 
you guys are doing as as physicians or as cardiologists or it's just general doctors you're probably doing these things in any case and if we can summarize it break it up into these four main real cogs it's talking about stroke risk and the stroke risk is something we do basically by using our chest to vascular i mean that's an important thing we're going to come on to it later Assessing the symptom severity, and this is what we use with using our EHRA scoring system. This is something that is pretty new to our current guidelines, but we're going to go through it again now. Uh, and then understanding the substrate severity, which I think they just said substrate basically because they wanted to use all the four S's here, right? But it's basically understanding the comorbidities, cardiovascular risk factors this individual does. And we do this by using a clinical assessment. And then often we combine this with imaging, whether it be most commonly a transthoracic echocardiogram. The more difficult form is to understand the severity of the atrial fibrillation burden. And this is helpful to us, especially as it is an assessment based on you know, the classification and the intermittent ECG. It's quite difficult to make. The problem is, is that it, this, this initial assessment and the classification, be it paroxysmal or persistent or you know, permanent, doesn't exactly correlate too well with individuals who have like 24 hour ECG monitoring. The real value in it is actually in identifying those patients who have more than six hours per day of atrial fibrillation and those individuals that progress to you know, more than 24 hours per week in atrial fibrillation, because that indicates an increase in mortality. And especially in, in, in young women, those individuals or women in general, those individuals uh, represent a higher risk of mortality. And that's why we want to understand how much time someone spends in atrial fibrillation. Looking at our diagnostic workup, I think diagnostic workup is pretty standard. It's history, it's a clinical exam, and then it basically it's a 12 lead ECG, all right? If we look at the basic bloods that we want to be doing for all individuals who are in atrial fibrillations, remember your thyroid function tests, remember your UNEs and electrolytes, and remember your full blood blood count. Generally, all individuals with atrial fibrillation needs to have a transthoracic echocardiogram being done for them. Obviously, this ranges in situations in, depending on the individual, if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic in terms of the timing of their echocardiogram and whether they are unstable or stable. But as a whole, all individuals who have atrial fibrillation should be getting an echo. The next step to step above that is in, in certain if selected patients is to identify you know, those who need 24 hour ECG monitoring, those people who may need a TOE. And specifically, those are generally related to those with valvular heart disease or those with either suspected or confirmed left atrial appendage stops. Those individuals who have some degree of focal ne neurological deficit, whether it be cognitive in the terms of you know, early onset dementia or you know, some form of dementia or physical uh, neurological deficits, or those individuals with significant high burden of symptoms um, as well as, as you know, uh, you know, uh, advanced advanced disease, and those. Are, this is basically the structure of the workout that we want to be following with patients. So just remember, for all atrial fibrillations. Make sure that you're doing good thorough clinical examination. Get the basics in some of your investigations, and just don't sleep on that twelve lead ECG. Make sure you guys are doing that twelve lead ECG, and then the echo is definitely part of the workout that needs to be done for these patients. Uh, looking at the EHRA symptom scale, I think it's pretty much uh, you guys will be very comfortable in getting to grips with an EHRA symptom scale. I think it's if you guys are familiar with the New York Heart uh, uh, Associations uh, for, for dyspnea, this is very, very much similar to it. We're talking about one with no symptoms, two, three, and four with mild, mild to moderate, severe, and four is disabling you know, from your symptoms. So this is something that we're going to use in terms of classification, but it's all part of just getting to grips with understanding these individuals, how are they feeling from their atrial fibrillation. Now, the chads to vascular. I think we're all familiar with chads to vascular, something that we all should be having at the tip of our tongue or on our phone, on our smartphone, just basically able to do it at any point. If we have a patient in front of us with atrial fibrillation, it should be in actual fact, it just should be a reflex for us. We shouldn't be talking about atrial fibrillation without talking about our CHAS2 vascular. Just to give you a brief background, CHAS2 vascular comes from the CHAS2 score, first proposed in 2001. So it's, it's been around for a while now, but it's largely been superseded by the CHAS2 vascular, which is a modification on it in order to understand the risk factors that are attributable to, to atrial fibrillation. And in, in itself, it's just a tool for clinical prediction of stroke risk, right? So 
It generally translates to the higher the score, the higher the stroke is, all right? We use a score of about one in males as a consideration tool and two in males and three in females as a recommendation for oral anticoagulation. Just briefly, what are the what is the maximum score you can get is nine. Remember that age is mentioned twice. You can't score twice for age, obviously. But uh, in itself, it's congestive heart failure, hypertension, be it on therapy itself. Age that is older than 75 is weighted higher. So that is, gives you two points. Diabetes, stroke, TIA or thromboembolism also weighted higher, gives you two points. And obviously the, vas the vascular disease, the age between 65 and 74, and the sex category of female. As, as uh, the female is, uh, the female sex category being part of the chest tube vas is used as a modification, a stroke risk modifier rather than an independent risk factor of itself. And remember that your maximum score is nine, using values of uh, one in males for consideration, two for recommendation, three in females for, for recommendation of, of oral anticoagulation. Moving on, uh, let's look at the risk factors that we need to talk about with regards to bleeding and oral anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. And I think this goes a fine large with regards to any patient that we're going to place on either aspirin, plavix, um, and or aspirin, plavix, or, or, or some form of anticoagulate, warfarin, plexin, um, and your NOAX. You want to be basically identifying your risk factors. Non-modifiable risk factors are pretty easy. Uh, for me, I don't need the 42 million and COVID uh, for the We 42 need permanent. Million. Non modifiable oh, risk factors are pretty, pretty standard. We know about them. It's elderly age, those individuals with severe organ dysfunction, big kidney, or liver, those individuals with malignancy, diabetes, non-modifiable risk factors. The modifiable and potentially modifiable risk factors is where we really want to be concentrating on. Those individuals with hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension, those patients with excessive alcohol therapies, you know, um, you know, those individuals with renal impairment, those individuals with anemia. I like how they include those individuals with hazardous hobbies and occupations, like, uh, I don't know what these patients, you know, cliff divers or I don't know, things like that. But, you know, it's basically just identify risk factors and look at what you can work at and what you can modify, because these are the things that are going to influence your ability to and to coagulate patients going forward. All right, here we go. Um, the Hasbled score. So the Hasbled score is kind of the follow on from your chest to vasque, right? So when you identify individual atrial fibrillation, reflex to the chest to vasque, now you must do the Hasbled score. Now the Hasbled score itself has been developed as a tool for assessment of your one year bleeding risk, right? Um, it is not as accurate in terms of determining uh, in a scale type fashion, i.e. higher score, higher bleeding risk, but rather it just goes and says, if your score is greater than or equal to three, you are now at high risk. And I, I, I must say it's high risk in inverted commas, very difficult to pinpoint what exactly your risk is in terms of, um, in terms Terms of bleeding, but what it it what it's what whilst it's moderately effective in predicting bleeding risk, its major use for us is to identify the modifiable risk factors, which by itself does not preclude an individual from anticoagulation. I mean, so these individuals that we identify using our hazard score uh, is basically for us to get that information in, so that we can try to modify what we can. All right, uh, it's important to know that a hazard score is is not going to say. Uh, you, you know, your patient has a Hasbro score four. Listen, we're not going to anticoagulate. This is this is not the role. It's to try to help us identify and modify. So just quickly going through them, it's uncontrolled hypertension, it's abnormal kidney or hepatic function. Remember that is one point for each, okay? Uh, stroke, uh, a history of uh, bleeding or predisposition to bleeding in the setting of those individuals with severe anemia or thrombocytopenia. Uh, those individuals, the labile INR, we often uh, don't understand labile INR uh, very, very well. Labile INR makes reference to those individuals who have their time in therapeutic range at less than 60%. It's, it makes reference to if you're receiving uh, warfarin or vitamin K antagonists, if you're basically identifying that this individual has, you know, in less than 60% of the time, their INRs are all over the show. They're not actually in that therapeutic range of two to three. Um, that's that's where you're going to award them score. Elderly, I think elderly needs to be taken. Um, 
under consideration. Uh, you know, those individuals aged more than 65 years have an independent risk for, for development of atrial fibrillation and for bleeding. But what we want to be careful of is just identifying those individuals who are exceptionally frail. And there's a number of frailty scores that you can look at. Time to get up and go, your walking distance. Um, you can look at frailty assessments in order to identify individuals, especially in our setting with extreme frailty that you have some concerns of with regards to starting anticoagulation for. And those individuals with drugs or excessive alcohol drinking. Um, before we move on, just want to touch on LAA closure. Right, so LAA closure um, is something probably not a lot of people outside probably cardiology themselves are very, very familiar with and probably don't understand fully. I mean, it's difficult itself for us to, to get to grips with. But uh, LAA closure itself can be done epicardially, so done by a cardiothoracic surgeon, which is actually epicardially tied off, or it can be done percutaneously. And we do do this procedure within ourselves. So trial data for us, specifically things like protect trial and prevail trial, basically note, uh, note that especially the watchman, which is one of the, the initial implants, and you can see it here as it plugs in and basically plugs off our left atrial appendage, has a non-inferiority to oral anticoagulation. And it's generally used in the setting of those individuals with high risk of bleedings. Those patients with thrombocytopenia that's non-responsive, those with individuals, generally the ones we see are recurrent bleeding or significant bleeding, such as an intracranial hemorrhage, those individuals with high risks of falls, um, those independent uh, individuals with uh, strong indications for dual antiplatelets and anticoagulants, or those individuals, not commonly in our setting, if we're honest, those individuals with poor compliance or intolerant to oral anticoagulant therapy. So this is what the left atrial appendage closure device actually looks like, goes inside. These are the three ones that we that are available, two ones that we are generally familiar with, the Watchman's and the Amplata plug, but uh, they defined as, as different devices depending on the shape uh, and the orientation of your left atrial appendage, how deep it is. Um, but these are the devices that are generally available for us. Uh, and these are some of the options we can use it for. Moving on, um, the, the prevention of, of, of thromboembolic events in those individuals for left atrial appendage. Remember that oral anticoagulation therapy may be considered, um, uh, these, these uh, sorry, uh, oral anticoagulation uh, therapy that it shouldn't be considered left atrial appendage closure is a, a, is a strategy that can be recommended and that's a class 2B recommendation for these individuals. In terms of now that we've diagnosed, we've identified individuals, we've done our chest to fast, we've done our has blood scores. Now we need to determine what form of therapy they're going to go on. And, and generally, the, the decision may, uh, you know, revolves around ANOAC versus Wolfram. Um, in our setting, uh, we have generally cost mandated and, and, and we're looking at Wolfram. Hopefully, in the future, we'll be able to be in a position where we can provide NOACs for, for all of our individuals. But um, these are the examples of NOACs that we have available. The NOAC we're probably most comfortable with is that of Rivaroxaban, which we do have available to some degree of state. It's called Zeralto. That may be the trade name that we're all, all familiar with. But just a couple of notes is that all of them have some degree of renal excretion with um, Dibigatran, which is, I think, Pradaxa, uh, about 80% uh, renal excretion. Uh, we use about an EGF of about 50 as a cutoff for the lower dose levels. And there's very, very limited evidence for food safety below an EGF of 30. So in our settings, even though it recommends there is some data for it to be used in about 15 to 30, generally below 30, we're going to prefer the use of either warfarin or low molecular weight heparin plexing um, for these individuals. Just another note to make sure that I think a lot of people get confused about is that there's no need because uh, there's no need for bridging with clexing in the setting of NOACs. I mean, because of the short half-life of our NOACs, um, there generally is no need for bridging with clexing therapy. So I see a lot of people get a bit stuck on this concept, but I just want to clear that up for us here. Um, when we talk about, um, you, you know, in individuals who've had a, sorry, and in individuals who've had, um, you know, a left atrial appendage closure device, just to inform you guys, it's probably not common that you will be dealing with these individuals outside the cardiology. But if you have a, a, a high bleeding risk, they 
basically after that device is inserted, you don't need to be put in an oral anticoagulant. These individuals definitely go on to dual antiplatelet therapies in the form of aspirin, almost indefinitely, and a period of clopidogrel for about one to six months, depending on your bleeding risk. Um, you can use a shorter time for certain individuals in very high risk situations, but generally these individuals, after the, uh, after the device is inserted, those patients are going on to DAPT for about six month period and then aspirin indefinitely. Uh, and these individuals, after studies have been done, have been shown to have, you know, a non-inferior experience as compared to those individuals on full oral anticoagulation. So if you look at the recommendations regarding stroke or stroke prevention, I mean, there's a lot of text here, but let's just summarize it and break it down very, very quickly. The first thing to, uh, to understand is that at this point in time, NOAX are actually recommended over warfarin, all right? And this is it's obviously a prosthetic valve or mitral stenosis, and this is now class one, all right? So in the ideal setting, in all of our individuals who are in atrial fibrillation, unless there's a prosthetic valve or MS, those individuals are going on to NOAX. Uh, remember that we've got to be using our chest to VASCO. I think that's basically what we're saying here. And we're using that cutoff of two in men and three in females as a recommendation target for, for oral anticoagulation. Uh, here, there's a, a lot of detail here there's a lot of detail in terms of, um, of, of text, but what we're basically trying to say is, just to summarize, is that use your has blood score. Use your has blood score. Make sure that you're using it in order to identify individuals at high risk of bleeding and use those individuals for frequent follow-up, as well as trying to address those modifying, uh, modifiable risk factors. And then uh, here, what we're basically looking at is, don't forget to reassess your patients. After the initial, initial diagnosis, let's look at reassessing these patients every four to six months after that initial diagnosis. Make sure that you're aiming for a target INR of between two and three. That's still a recommendation. I think that's, just, that's pretty common or center across the board. Um, but remember that you're trying to get your individual into this time of therapeutic range at greater than 70%. Um, lastly, here with regards to, to recommendations for stroke prevention, remember that number one, antiplatelet therapy is not, not recommended at all. I mean, that is a class three recommendation. We should not be using antiplatelet therapy alone in, in, as, as a stroke prevention, uh, you know, uh, treatment mechanism in atrial fibrillation. Um, think twice before denying a patient for anticoagulation on the basis of a, of a has blood score or, or something like that. Remember that these individuals have really, really high risk for, for the development of stroke. And as we've spoken about it already, the stroke itself, the stroke risk is can be severe, the disability can be significant, and, and can be often fatal. All right. And then uh, the lastly is that the clinical pattern when we talk about atrial fibrillation does not exactly infer uh, a treatment a direction as well. Okay, nextly is a big question, rate and rhythm. I mean, which comes first, which is more important? Which do we do? Let's, let's have a look, right? So <clears throat> the two main trials that kind of define our thinking on this came in 2002 and there's two trials, the RACE trial and the INFIRM trial. For all of those FCP candidates who are looking to prepare, these are probably the trials that you wanna know about, you know, RACE and AFIRM. And basically they were both published in the NAGM and to cut a long story short, um, they basically show us that rate control is non-inferior to a rhythm control strategy in terms of outcomes and survivability for those individuals with atrial fibrillation. So rate versus uh, rhythm, they're kind of equivalent in, in the nature or rates rather is non-inferior uh, to rhythm control. And as such, uh, and as such, you know, rate control itself becomes a backbone of all of our atrial fibrillation treatment. You know, that all patients will get some form of rate control in some way or another. Rate control itself is kind of uh, preferred in those individuals who are either asymptomatic, who are intolerant, who have failed our rhythm control strategies for whatever reason, be it the drugs or the ablation, on those individuals who are very, very elderly. I mean, we're going to adopt a strategy that just says, Let's, let's get on top of the rate. Let's make sure we get it at least below 110. Um, for those of you who are interested, the rate of 110 is actually based on the RACE2 trial, the follow-up trial and the RACE trial, which found out that we are a lenient heart, a lenient heart rate target of about 110 was non-inferior to a stricter heart rate of about 80 um, and was much easier to achieve in itself. 
Um, and uh, yeah, these are the basics of what we're talking about when we talk about rate control, right? Number of drugs that are available for us to use. You guys are familiar with these. We go from beta blockers, uh, the digitalis glycosides, basically digoxin, uh, non dihydroperidine calcium channel blockers. Those are the verapamils and the dultiazins, and obviously everybody's favorite drug, amiodron, right? Looking at this schematic diagram uh, in terms of approach uh, to those individuals for, for rate control, basically the drug choice is generally determined by your cardio, uh, co comorbidities. As cardiovascular disease is the most common or serious comorbid condition, beta blockers are generally from the mainstay of rate control strategy. So in, in general, if you want to adopt a rate control strategy, your first line is going to be a beta blocker, right? There are lots of other options that exist when beta blockers are not tolerated or contraindicated. We've spoken about them briefly already, verapamil, dutiazem, digoxin in certain cases, and amiodron. Remember that amiodron, if you're talking about a rate control strategy, probably going to be a lot lower down on your list in terms of management for these patients. Just very, very briefly, if we can summarize this, um, beta blockers or our calcium channel blockers, if we've spoken about the verapamil, the dutiazem, they form our first line of treatment in atrial fibrillation, especially if our individuals have, have an injection fraction of more than 40%, once it drops below 40%, we're looking at beta blockers as our first line with uh, the combination of digoxin in certain cases as well. And let's aim for that heart rate of less than 110. Okay. Um, going forward, the, here we're just talking about AV nodal ablation. Um, if we talk about AV nodal ablation, it's probably going to be a last resort, all right? Remembering that these individuals are going to need a pacemaker afterwards. If we use AV nodal ablation, remember this is very, very different from, you know, uh, pulmonary vein isolation. Pulmonary vein isolation. So that's, that's, um, that's something different in itself. And amiodrone, just to just to confirm, amiodrone is uh, recommended in the acute setting um, for rate control. So amiodrone class to be, if you have a patient with a rapid AF, definitely don't hesitate. If you have access to it, not sure, you don't have access to anything else, amiodrone definitely can be recommended for use in the acute setting. Now, rhythm control. Rhythm control, what does it mean, rhythm control? So rhythm control is basically our attempt to restore and maintain sinus rhythm. It's basically what we're talking about, cardioversion, cardioversion as a whole, uh, excluding, you know, the defib machine. We're talking about pharmacological, electrical, or percutaneous cardioversion. Percutaneous cardioversion making reference to those with pulmonary vein isolation. And uh, when do we use rhythm control? I think that's the major feature that we, we actually want to know about. So rhythm control, we gotta, we gotta be thinking about as a preferred strategy in those patients who are definitely younger, who those uh, patients who had a diagnosis of uh, atrial fibrillation within the last 12 months, those individuals obviously with failed rate control and those individuals with high cardiovascular disease risk. I mean, those elderly people, those individuals with stroke or thromboembolic disease, um, females should be considered, those individuals with heart failure, other significant cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, chronic kidney disease, significant left ventricular hypertrophy. These are all features that we should be looking at and thinking about when we say, listen, are we going to go rate versus rhythm and is rhythm the best option in this setting? Remember that we've got to keep in mind things like tachyarrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy, so arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathies with atrial fibrillation, definitely a contributor in terms of the development of these cardiomyopathies. So just to summarize, in a sense that rate, rhythm control strategy is definitely a class one recommendation especially if we're talking about symptom and quality improvement, uh, quality of life improvement in those symptomatic individuals where we can attribute those symptoms directly through to atrial fibrillation. Now, if we have to talk about our principles of choosing these antiarrhythmic drugs, I think just to summarize, we got to focus on reducing our symptoms. We got to maintain sinus rhythm and we got to identify those antiarrhythmic drugs which are safe. Those, you know, we gotta consider those, we gotta have those safety considerations at the forefront of our minds, especially when using these anti drugs. Um, and then if we have to look at these, you know, basic rules, I mean, remember, we've got to consider our, what is our baseline ECG? Keep in mind, you know, QRS duration, the presence of a left bundle branch block, 
how long your PR interval is, how long your QTC interval is. We gotta be familiar and, and comfortable with those things before we decide on, uh, on a um, anti-arrhythmic drug. Uh, we've gotta look for evidence of structural heart disease and this is where our echo comes in, help, uh, in handy. And we've gotta be thinking about drug-drug interactions. A lot of these drugs, anti-arrhythmic drugs, interfere or interact rather, with our you know, blood pressure control, our anti-failure agents, as well as things like digoxin, as well as anticoagulations as well. So I know that you guys are very familiar with uh, you know, most of these drugs, but let's just touch on them itself. Amiodrone, probably our most commonly available, widely used, regularly available drug. Things to keep in mind is that amiodrone is about 37 to 40% of its molecular weight is just iodine. All right, so this is something to keep in mind, especially with our endocrine patients, especially with patients who have thyroid disease, or you can consider may develop some form of an amiodarone induced uh, uh, you know, uh, thyroid disease. You know, It is toxic in itself to the lung, the liver, the thyroid, as, we, uh, as we've spoken about as well. And it definitely has a degree of interactions with warfarin, right? So we have to be considered considerate of our warfarin and amiodarone interactions and how we're going to do dose adjustments or how those patients are going to have their PI clinic monitoring. Um, if we look at, uh, also we got to look at QT prolongation, all right? So QT prolongation is something common. So remember, once we've initiated amiodarone, you've got to be following up these patients with, an, with subsequent ECGs because you, be, you want to be aware of those individuals at risk for it, because whilst Tossard de Pont is quite rare, it is, an, it, is a, um, it is a recognized, you know, kind of complication of those individuals with the amiodarone usage. Flecainide, I'm just going to touch on these quite briefly, because, I mean, most of us do not have access to it in the public sector, but you never know. Some of your patients may have the ability to provide this from their own private, and it's always important to know about these things for our guys who are will uh, eventually will work in private. Flecainide, also known as Tambacor, is something that is effective, it's efficient, it works well, all right, but has specific niche cases usage. Remember that we can't be using it with those individuals with kidney disease or liver disease. We can't use it in patients with structural heart disease and left bundle branch blocks or widened QRSs. So Flecainide, Tambacor, good drug, niche, niche use case. Also, uh, uh, propafenone, also known as Rhythmol, I think that's a trade name for it. Very, very similar in flecainide, also effective, efficient in terms of, uh, you know, restoring sinus rhythm for patients. Um, but watch out for those interactions with warfarin and digoxin. Watch out for structural heart disease, the YQRS, left bundle branch block, and, and your chronic kidney disease. So in terms of our recommendations, Basically, flecainide, propafenone, and iodine, they all represent really effective rhythm control solutions within their own kind of unique niche circumstances. A patient fits all of these criteria, and you're quite happy to monitor these probable drug interactions that these patients may have. These, this, you know, it's, it's also important to note here, I think that might be, uh, you know, something that may come up is that just because you've now restored rhythm does not mean that you have to work, you can you can abort or you can stop your anticoagulation this this is not the truth i mean you still have to anticoagulate these patients what you're doing is just basically reducing the burden of of atrial fibrillation and improving the symptoms thereof you know um in terms of cardioversion just quickly let's have a look at this if we can summarize it unstable patients is, is nice and easy. It removes the uncertainty from the situation. Just shock these guys, you know? All right, we start off with synchronized cardio versions. Try to get your pads in an AP position. It's way more successful. Um, it facilitates better electrical cardio version. It's better done with pads versus paddles in this situation. Remember you place the sternal pad and the apex pad should be placed directly between the shoulder blades at the back. And this actually gives you a better success rate, especially in the position uh, especially in the patients with uh, slightly higher BMIs, really look at doing this. It will give you better results in terms of your, your cardioversion. Your stable patients, <clears throat> you got to consider their oral anticoagulation status before you consider whether you go pharmacological or electrical. And importantly, you must remember that you've got to continue oral anticoagulations after you cardiovert these patients. Remember that there are increased risks for atrial fibrillation. I mean, these patients can revert back into atrial fib. You can kind of get an idea for those patients, if they're older, female, those patients with uh, structural heart disease, those patients with big LAs on echo, those patients are most likely 
also those patients with heart failure. But those, these patients are generally the ones that are going to revert way back into atrial fibrillation. Um, just quickly looking at this drug, I think it's one of the new, newer drugs. Not all of us are familiar with. Just want to touch on it. I don't even know how to say it properly. Venacalant, I think it is. The trade name is a little bit more fancier. It's called Brynavis. It's rapidly acting. It's quite efficient and it's atrial selective um, form of cardioversion. It is available in South Africa. It's only an IV formulation. So just keep this in mind when, you, when you're considering uh, um, restoration of acute restoration with the use of IV, IV medication. And then obviously amiodarone. Amiodarone, you guys are familiar with, well-established drug, widely used for, for the acute restoration of atrial and sinus rhythm in atrial fibrillation. Uh, moving on, if we can just look at this, recommendations of stroke risk management. Key things here, or key issues here. Remember, at least three weeks of anticoagulation needs to be done prior to elective cardioversion, elective electrical cardioversion, or in place of that, you can consider doing a, a TOE for these patients. So TOE is primarily in order to exclude an intracardiac thrombus. And, and the basic areas that we're looking at that we can't visualize nicely on transthoracic echo is, is basically the left atrial appendage. Um, other recommendations here for stroke risk management is that um, if you find a thrombus, you got to delay that electric, elective uh, electrical cardioversion by at least three weeks. And, um, you know, it is a class 2A indication, I mean, class 2A evidence, but uh, you can bypass the TOE uh, if you can confirm that this patient has recent onset of atrial fibrillation and it's happened within the last 48 hours. So that's something else to keep in mind if you need to um, consider cardioversion or, or electrical cardioversion for patients. Um, other things to, to make note of is that you've got to continue that oral anticoagulation for at least four weeks afterwards, all right, and possibly longer based on your stroke risk assessment, okay? Um, indications for, for catheter ablation, we're just going to talk about this very, very quickly, but catheter ablation represents a class one indication. I think that's important to note. As a first-line option in the setting of atrial fibrillation uh, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as well as a class one indication in those individuals who have failed drug therapy, and that's specifically with regards to those individuals with paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. Um, another big topic that often comes up is how do we manage oral anticoagulation in the setting of those individuals with a coronary syndrome? So coronary syndromes, whether they be acute or chronic, and atrial fibrillation definitely poses challenges to us. I think the main thing to understand is that in those individuals who have had some form of, of, of PCI um, is that we need to be using triple therapy. And when I talk about triple therapy, I'm talking about the combination of an oral anticoagulate and the two antiplatelet agents, the P2Y12 inhibitors, as well as aspirin. So primarily we're looking at using triple therapy in those individuals who have had PCI, okay, where they've been acute coronary syndrome or chronic coronary syndrome. So those individuals who've had, let's say, stable angina, or those individuals who've had positive excess stress tests, they've been referred for the angio, we take them to angio, we find prognostic lesions, which we intervene and we PCI on them. Those individuals, we're going to triple therapy for them for about a month. We're going to switch them over onto a oral anticoagulant plus an antiplatelet agent. It's generally going to be uh, Plavix in our setting, so our P2Y12 inhibitor. We're going to continue that for about six months. And then long-term, beyond that six months time, we're going to, in the chronic coronary syndromes, we're just going to be, keep them on the, the oral anticoagulant, be it warfarin or the NOAC. And those individuals who were acute, we're going to keep them on those plate, uh, Plavix and, and warfarin or Plavix and Zeralto up to about 12 months. And they continue long-term with just the oral anticoagulant. Just remember this, because especially in the last, let's say, uh, since, about, yeah, since about 2020, since we've had these individuals who have basically only come in for repeat scripts or fallen through the cracks for whatever reasons, especially because of this COVID pandemic, a lot of them have been just getting repeated scripts. Sometimes they've been followed up with other hospitals and just continued out on the medication. Just keep these in mind because we want to be reducing their the bleeding risk over time. We don't want to be keeping patients on like triple therapy for like 12 months. I mean, it's completely inappropriate. Um, other things to note is that if we're just medically treating this ACS, um, those individuals are probably only going to be on a NOAC and only a single platelet agent, and that's going to be combined up until six, uh, six months, and then long-term, beyond six months, it's easy. We just 
going to give them the, either the warfarin or the or the Zeralta. Um, just to recommend, I mean, uh, want to summarize here, it's that a lot of meta-analyses have been showing us that we have reduced bleeding outcomes with NOAX over warfarin when used in conjunction with the antiplatelet agents. And that's that's why we are starting to prefer the, the use of NOAX in our in our patients who have had uh, had PCI. So we tend to prefer them over the use of warfarin. All right. And then looking at our high bleeding risks, we're going to be adjusting our doses thereof. Um, strokes, All right? So cryptogenic stroke, which itself is quite of a uh, a difficult term to, for us to be completely clear on, but if we look at the definition of cryptogenic stroke, it's talking about a cerebral infarction. It is not attributable to a source that is a definite cardiac embolic, uh, large artery atherosclerosis, or small artery disease. And this is through our standard workups, right? So that's what a cryptogenic stroke itself means. Um, and what we should be doing for these individuals in our ideal setting as well is that all of these guys should be getting short-term ECG monitoring for the first 24 hours and then continuous ECG monitoring at least for 72 hours when it is possible, right? Um, in an ideal setting, selected patients can even consider for a loop recorder. So those individuals at high risk with a significant, um, you know, cryptogenic stroke, those individuals with a history that's highly suspicious for atrial fibrillation without a confirmatory diagnosis, we can even consider these patients for a loop recorder. For those who you do not know what a loop recorder is, it's a small implantable device. It's like an ECG monitor. It's inserted in about the fifth intercostal space, just in that parasternal border. It's very, very small, kind of looks like an old school watch battery. And it basically is either patient or self-activating, and it kind of assesses that patient for an arrhythmia. We can be able to pick up these atrial high rate episodes from them. Um, if we look at uh, stroke prevention for acute ischemic stroke, um, here I just want to say that we've got to be cautious in our approach of initiating anticoagulation in that acute period. So in the first 48 hours after that ischemic stroke, we really want to be careful about starting our, these patients on therapy, clexane, or warfarin, generally nobody's going to be giving these patients an unfractionated heparin, but you want to be very, very careful. It's a class three recommendation. you got to be careful and, and rather not uh, institute it in the first 48 hours because you have to be worried about hemorrhagic conversion, which can be significantly debilitating for patients and lead to very, very poor outcomes. Um, another big, big topic we often get cons uh, consulted about is what to do in the setting of an intracranial bleed, right? So intracranial hemorrhage. It's a big therapeutic dilemma. And, and the, the real question is, when is the ideal start uh, starting time for anticoagulation, right? If at all, I mean, do we start at all? And it, it's all about identifying those risk factors as we've spoken about before. This is it's demonstrated here on the left-hand side of this diagram, but we look about modifiable risk factors. What can we, what can we reduce? As a whole, uh, a class 2A recommendation is about two to four weeks after the, the intracranial bleed is to, re, is to start this patient on anticoagulation. This has to be taken, you know, we have to consider how severe the bleed is, what is the neurological status and condition of the patient at that point in time, and what is the burden of atrial fibrillation? How often is this patient, you know, having atrial fibrillation? And is this patient in itself a, a consideration for? a left atrial appendage closure device. I mean, can this, should we be referring this patient on to cardiology for consideration? That's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, in certain individuals, those frail individuals who are elderly with significant neurological deficit after the event, probably something to consider and discuss with both patient and family is whether we withhold anticoagulation full stop and, and have no uh, you know, uh, stroke prevention therapy. Um, Big concern for all of us is obviously how do we manage bleeding for patients with, with oral anticoagulation? We'll have to divide it into those individuals on warfarin versus those individuals on a NOAC. But I think um, the, the mainstay is support management for bleeding takes precedence in these cases, right? In terms of minor bleeds, um, those generally, are, are, we, are, we just hold the dose. We delay the warfarin or we hold the, the, oral, the NOAC for, for a day or two in order to get ourselves under control with the bleeding and we then continue, right? Those don't affect our management. In the setting of moderate to severe, we generally, in the setting of warfarin, 
uh, we generally are going to give that patient a dose of vitamin K. Now, giving that patient vitamin K is, is difficult. Um, we want to go for our lowest dose acceptable. You'll see a lot of guidelines and a lot of uh, values bandied about. It's generally in the range of 2.5 to about 5 milligrams of vitamin K. As an IV stack dose, the reason being is that it affects your long-term ability to maintain that time and therapeutic range after you've resolved the bleed. So once that bleeding has stopped, you're going to find it really, really difficult for the next upcoming weeks in order to manage um, that, patient's, that patient's INR. So that's why vitamin K is a bit tricky in these patients. And in the severe patients, I think it's quite standard. We're going to stop our oral anticoagulants. Uh, whether it be warfarin or, or the Norax, and we need to provide them with some form of, of blood products. Now, remember, it's, we're going to be using prothrombin complex concentrate. That is what we actually want, all right? FFP is a poor substitute, but in some cases, it's just the only one we have available, so it can be used. And in a setting of, of Norax, um, we have to consider specific antidotes. So now we may not have it available. If you guys need to know what they are, it's generally things like Praxbind and um, and and Dexanate. Praxbind is used for the Vigatran and Pradaxa, and Dexanate is a newer agent. It is acts like a decoy binder for the other Noax. Can be used for Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, as well as uh, our Erixtra, uh, Factor Ten A subcutaneous uh, injections. Um, so those are the kind of uh, antidotes we have available for us. And um, yeah, so that's how we're going to be managing patients with, with bleeding. If we look at valvular heart disease, realistically, data is lacking in the setting in terms of, of, of uh, the use of Norax in, in valvular heart disease. A lot of data that's available, for example, newer studies that come from non-atrial fibrillation anticoagulation with individuals who've had TAVIs. Okay, and this was published, I think, in the last... A year out of the NEGM, it looks at worse outcomes, right, for patients uh, using Xeralto specifically. So although it's not related to atrial fibrillation, at this point in time, no acts are no go with regards to, to valvular heart disease. So we're not using them for those individuals. Um, pregnancy, uh, big topic um, as well. I think fundamentally, uh, the mainstay for us here is that, you know, don't hesitate to shock the unstable pregnant woman. Okay. Data is lacking here, obviously, because nobody is going to do a randomized control trial on pregnant women and shocking them. But um, you know, you, what you do by by providing electrical cardioversion is that you provide you know rapid cardioversion. Okay, you don't prolong this disruption to placental blood flow, and generally, it's it's going to be class one. You're going to treat these women, if, even though they're pregnant, as as if they're just not pregnant, and you're going to shock these individuals. Um, you can also consider things like uh, in individuals who have, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you should consider cardioversion. We can talk about abutilide and flecainide as a class 2B indication. But what I want you guys to remember is that if you get a call from the gynae, someone's unstable with atrial fibrillation, those patients need to be shocked, right? In terms of long term strategies, uh, you're going to be using, um, you're going to be using, remember, clexane. For these patients, you, you're not going to be using warfarin in the setting of of, um, of 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 pregnancy. Rhythm control strategies are going to be where we're going to be preferred to be uh, in terms of management for them. And in the acute setting, if you need to do acute rate control, make use of our beta blockers. We don't have a lot of them available in terms of. Uh, I think the main a major agent we have, I think, is esmolol. Sotalol is probably going to be your preferred agent. Um, if you if you need to get acute rate control, but um, yeah, I mean that's how we need to manage these these pregnant women. Um, just lastly, I mean a lot of us will be getting uh, calls from from uh, our colleagues in surgery or anesthetics in terms of what do we do. They notice this patient has a fast rhythm. They've done ECG. They think it's atrial fibrillation. What what do we do from here? So in the postoperative setting, I think it's pretty simple. Um, it generally manages. Um, you know, as as a as a non post operative patient, but there's a couple of things to to keep in mind: are these patients optimized in terms of fluid balance, oxygenation, and, and pains? Are they on inotropes or vasopressors? Because those definitely contribute to to your atrial fibrillation, and um, uh, were they on any form of prophylaxis? 
Now, prophylaxis itself is, is a little bit tricky. Um, if patients are on beta blockers, definitely continue beta blockers preoperatively uh, because these individuals, beta blockers definitely reduce the occurrence of postoperative um, atrial fibrillation. But the routine use, the routine use of a beta blocker in an individual which does not have any significant risk factors for or significant heart disease requiring beta blockers, we not shouldn't be using beta blockers routinely for these individuals, you know, uh, going to theater just to prevent a possible postoperative atrial fibrillation. So if we find this patient with atrial fibrillation in a postoperative state, I mean, are they unstable? Just shock them. If they're not unstable, these patients need to have systemic anticoagulation and, and then we treat them with regards to this rhythm versus rate control strategies. Okay, um, from my side, I think that's it. Thank you guys very, very much for your attention. I know that it is a lot of, of stuff to cover. These are, if anyone of you guys have read the guidelines, they are in excess of like a hundred pages. So they are extremely in depth, but um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope you, I hope you uh, got something from it. All right, thank you, Reese. Uh, that was very comprehensive. Um, probably a little bit information overload for an hour session, but uh, nevertheless, thank you. I think uh, we've got it on record and recorded and uh, we can obviously have questions comments, um, maybe just to open up a few key pertinent elements to consider. First, just to highlight that there is an effort from the NDOH to get NOAX on board. Um, it's currently under review and hopefully with budget issues and cost issues, we may have them as part of the EDL. Um, when treating patients with uh, warfarin, please bear in mind that the time and therapeutic range is very important. Um, that's something we often don't consider. We basically treat and forget and the PI clinic sorts it out and monitors it, but always reevaluate. If patients aren't getting an adequate time and therapeutic range of above uh, 70%, you are not getting value for your money. And in fact, it increases risk of complications such as bleeding and you not protecting your patients from thromboembolic events. And then the last issue was with the rhythm strategy in uh, heart failure. Um, uh, it, there's a lot of uh, guidelines that are now pushing for a rhythm strategy as first priority in patients with heart failure. We know that AF generally precipitates heart failure and a lot of data is emerging um, that we should uh, push and uh, attempt to attain sinus rhythm. So in those patients do at least give that patient a chance for uh, a rhythm strategy. Don't just accept rate control anticoagulation uh, because often that will deteriorate the heart failure symptomatology as well as the quality of life and actually even outcomes. On that note, um, open to the floor. Any questions, comments? We already tight on time one minute before nine. Any burning questions, comments? Right, it looks like Reese, uh, you've satisfied everyone's uh, appetite. And uh, thank into you. silence, most likely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks for so. Thank you, thank you for attending, and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye.